We followed the knights to a hidden opium den which resided beneath a popular pub. Walking through the crowds and being unnoticed was another convenient feature of being an angel. It was such a bother to wait in life, but it has its winning traits in death. Upon reaching the entrance, Wyatt said, This is where the meetings take place. How clever of them. A nice place where their corruption and recruit new members, I commented. Yeah, and sway the troubled souls in this manner, Victor added. Peter's anxiety had grown since while making our way to the cellar door, which led to the den. A haze of gray smoke enveloped the room, which had the rich flowery aroma laced with tobacco. Pillows were scattered about the floor, with dazed people laying upon them. The men had loosened their shirts and collars, while the women had unbound hair and unlaced corsets. A few were in the throes of passion by kissing each other lustfully. I suppose the present term would be making out. From out of the haze emerged another angel with red wings, and clad in a light, rosy dress. Her hair had been compared to cotton candy since it was short, pink, and fluffy. The red eyes twinkled like rubies, and skin being a pastel pink, which glowed faintly by her smile. Hello, hello, I am Penny, the angel greeted us cheerfully. Servant of Venus, how do you like my work? She gestured towards the couples while beaming proudly. Truly indecent, Fräulein, Victor said, his tone being disgusted and blunt. Yes, but we are not here to judge, gentlemen and lady, Wyatt said, dismissing the situation. I could care less, I commented. It does not disgust you? Peter asked in bewilderment. No, I suppose the best word to describe my feelings towards it is apathy, I answered. Oh, that's too bad, but you have two crushes on your heart. Choose wisely, Penny said and chuckled with a hint of mischief to her tone. I scowled a bit towards her and said, Let me guess, you are responsible for that. She giggled and said proudly, Guilty as charged. <laughs> Venus knows your lack of love and needs you to smile, Miss Gloomy. Oh, isn't that just lovely, I muttered. Hey, don't look down on her gifts. Love is a precious thing, Penny objected. Speaking of love, we need to ask you questions, Penny, Wyatt said seriously. Ask me anything, she chimed. Has there been any weddings here recently, he asked. No, but there was a big lust party here last night. So much fun it was, and with a bald man in charge, she said with another giggle. <laughs> what was his name? It's very important, he said. Um, Mr. Alistair Crawley, she replied. I have heard of him. A wicked man who fancies himself a wizard. Truly a beast, Victor said gravely. As you were there for the past lust parties, Peter, you are a beast for all the ladies, Penny said. The men looked to Peter sternly while he released an involuntary nervous gulp as he had a hand to my face. I shook my head while sighing. You have some explaining to do, boy, Wyatt said firmly and with authority. I was until Penny opened her gob. Peter said in defense. Why are you hiding? Victor demanded. Peter inhaled deeply and shook during a rattled exhale. Go on, tell them, I said gently encouraging him. He inhaled again and exhaled the confession. I was a member. What? Both exclaimed in unison. This has come from spill to overflow. Maybe I should go. And he said with apprehension, No, stay. Your powers could actually help, I insisted. How? she asked. By having them still care about Peter. We cannot fall apart now. I explained. Ah, I get it, she said, realizing my plan. With that, the love angel took a yellow pouch from her belt, removed a handful of golden glittery dust, and tossed it upon the arguing men. Friendly powder, she said. Penny, thanks to you, Penny, I said, exhaling a sigh of relief. We grinned to see them be pacified under the dust. The hostility lowered to a mild frustration within seconds. My work is done. Bye-bye. 
Benny said and made a hasty exit through the brick wall. We need your help, Peter. Any information you can give us will be useful on the inside, Wyatt said. I will tell you everything that has happened, Peter said pensively. Victor spoke suddenly and said, Someone is coming. It's a good thing we are still invisible, I said. The stairs creaked beneath heavy footsteps, and a somewhat heavy-set man had stepped out into the hazy smoke. He was a bald young man who wore fine gentleman's clothes, sported a tattoo of an ankh upon his left hand, and greeted the group. Good evening, my followers. How are you faring today? Very well, Master Crowley. Accelerated! I'll hail the new leader! were his responses from the intoxicated group. Ah, good. Our lives are far better than the common folk on the surface streets. Have all of you acquired the parts we needed? He inquired. An elderly man stepped forward while clutching his hat and said, Uh, not entirely. Explain yourself, their leader exclaimed. We are having a lot of trouble getting a liger's teeth in a thief's hands. He explained, wringing his hat's brim while looking to the floor in shame. Oh, bother! Our summoning of Zuggo has to be delayed by a day, Crowley said in frustration. May we ask why we need two opposite sexes' genital organs, Master? A burly man with a curly black hair asked. It is necessary as Zalgo represents the dark energy of all humanity, an opposite counterpart to the creation deity's original likeness when they were created humans. The first human was a hermaphrodite. We are the counterculture and everything of Zalgo is represented by the parts. Is that understood? He explained impatiently. Yes, master. Each person said in unison. Now go and do your jobs, he ordered. With that command, the entire group filed up the stairs, with their leader following behind them. What is going on here? Wyatt said, well exasperated. They were talking about our abomination of a god, Peter said. Tell us the full history, Victor said. Yes, tell us everything as promised, I added, patting Peter's back gently. He began to tell us the full background of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The grudge against normal society and all that is positive stand back to ancient Egyptian priesthood. They had a clash of ideals that were not favorable with the Egyptian royalty and tried to give Zalgo warm many times for thousands of years. Every leader was the reincarnation of their first leader who had become the cult. Zalgo needed body parts of corrupted people to create a necessary avatar to interact in this world. Once he joins this world, it shall lead an army of the dead to take over the world. I was perplexed by this history as were Wyatt and Victor. They do as they please, and harmony and virtue was trivial to these people, only to be left to interpretation by what suits them best at an innocent people's expense. It seemed to have motivated us more than ever to stop this cult. The four of us were silent for a long moment, and I placed my hands upon Peter's shoulders while he stared at the floor. He faced me with a pensive expression, and I kissed his forehead, whispering, I will help you every step of the way, Peter Potter. It's time we buried your past and purge your guilt. Zalgo can crawl back to whatever hole he emerged from. He has no power over you. Yeah, yes, you're right. Thank you, he said sheepishly while blushing. Fraulein, may I speak to you in private? Victor asked gently. I nodded to him as he gestured to follow him to another room which held wooden boxes. You are worried? I asked casually. Yes, and curious. Sit down, please, he said. I had sat upon one of the boxes and looked upward to his softened face. Hope, you are experiencing a complex. I have read your history record five times, and your past is colorful, to put it mildly. You defied your parents' wishes to marry a British officer during America's colonial era. 
You impersonated a boy and fought in a militia. You killed and tortured enemy soldiers while in the war. But you died selflessly for the love of a comrade in arms. Is your livelihood so trivial that you would throw it away? He said, lowering himself to my level. I was so young and foolish then, but it was willing to be part of a cause, to have a true calling instead of being someone's domestic slave and a brood mother. I knew that I was more than just the sum of my parts. That's why I did those things, and despite that pervert from marrying me, he did not care for me. Just saw me as a status symbol, I answered softly, while a few tears rolled from my cheeks. Victor removed a handkerchief from his pocket to clean my face and said, You felt unloved, have you not? I could only respond with a slow nod while shutting my eyes. Look at me, doctor, he said returnally. It warmed my heart to know that word translated to daughter. My eyes met his, and he hugged me. This time I did not hesitate to return the hug while gripping his shirt and felt vulnerable for the first time in decades. You are very wrong, Fräulein. You are a fighter and have love to give, yet you doubted that anyone would give love to you. Your silence in the underworld was your supposed protection from being hurt again, has it not? He said. Yes, why would anyone give love to me? I am worthless, was my only reply. You were kind and protected others from being bullied while in the academy. You let Persephone be her dress-up doll in spite of being humiliating for you. And look at what you are doing for Peter. If that is not worthy to be loved, then I would like to know something better, he said firmly. You are very wrong, Fräulein. You are a fighter and have love to give, yet you doubted that anyone would give love to you. Your silence in the underworld was your supposed protection from being hurt again, has it not? He said. Yes, why would anyone give love to me? I am worthless, was my only reply. You were kind and protected others from being bullied while in the academy. You let Persephone be her dress-up doll beside being humiliating for you, and look what you are doing for Peter. If that is not worthy to be loved, then I would like to know something better, he said firmly. His words made a direct impact on my mind and felt even more foolish. How could I have been oblivious to my own self-worth for so long? Why has not anyone took the time to tell me these things since I had died? Victor was the only one who cared enough to give me this epiphany. I can only hug him tightly and say, Danke, Papa.